Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Professor's Podcast. I am here with William Coleman, author of Their Fiery Cross of Union. <laughs> William, thank, thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much, Avatar. And William, what was Their Fiery Cross of Union? Well, in essence, it's a reference most directly to the Southern Cross, the famous constellation in the sky. That had become, during the 19th century, a significant uh, symbol of Australian identity for several reasons. Firstly, the Southern Cross, of course, only appears in the Southern Hemisphere. Secondly, <laughs> that's us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Secondly, it is a cross and symbolising Christianity, which um, um, Australia was, was founded upon. And thirdly, it's been stressed that in the 19th century, the absence of electric lighting meant the skies, the night skies, were just more visible. They were just more important. They were just more conspicuous. And so by the middle of the 19th century, there was already an Australian flag. It's actually the New South Wales ensign, to be a bit more technical, which bore the Southern Cross. And later, the other Australian colonies, including Victoria, adopted the Southern Cross um, on their flags. So when Federation was approaching or the cause of Federation was approaching at the end of the 19th century, it's not surprising that at least some Federationists um, adopted um, the Southern Cross. In particular, the form they used it was in the New South Wales Ensign, which they renamed the federal flag and which they campaigned under. So that's the fiery cross of union, because my book is about the Federation. It may not be fiery, but it was called, <laughs> it was described as the fiery cross of union by one quite prominent Federationist. The man well, and of course, century. people can get that book from Connor Court. I've, I'm showing the uh, website right now, and it is available for sale at Connor yeah. Court. Um, William, you know, re reading the book, it sounds a lot more to me like the damp squib of union, <laughs> the firing cross, fiery cross of union. I mean, how much passion was there in Australia uh, in the decade leading up to uh, the Federation in 1901? Well, there was both um, passion and um, indifference. It's always been, an, if you like, something of an embarrassment to federationists that in the first round of referendums in 1898, only a minority of those persons entitled to vote and enrolled actually bothered to vote one way or another. If you like, there was, it seemed, a great indifference. And yet by 1899, the matter had become, had, had gained a considerable degree of public, a considerable degree of public engagement. And there was no um, lack of passion um, in particular New South Wales, in Queensland, which were divided down the middle over the issue. Uh, the remaining colonies or states as they would become were um, much more favorable. They were not divided, but they were quite excited and enthusiastic. So my book is all about taking down federation, but um, take it down a few pegs, taking off the tinsel and trying to um, lay the reality bare a bit more. But I would not claim that um, the cause of federation happened without people noticing it. Not at all. Well, I'm, I'm sure people noticed it, but were they particularly in favor of it? I mean, of course, we had, you know, I'm American in the United States. We're, we're you know, all very aware of the American Revolution. Uh, there's, it strikes me that there was a, may have been a lot less excitement in Australia. Actually, frankly, I'm surprised as a guest here that whenever I hear about, you know, the formation of Australia, I hear about Anzacs and Gallipoli. I don't hear about the glories of Federation. Uh, yeah, I think that's you know, what, I mean, what does Federation play in Australia's imagination of itself? Well, the thesis of my book was that um, federation was premature. Hmm. Um, if you like, Australia wasn't ready for it. And it was a, 
if you like, artificially incited project. Um, and complementing that thesis, I think the beginning of a common Australian consciousness was really in the First World War. And I have to say, in, um, reinforced importantly, in the Second World War. You could say really only in the 1940s was there an unambiguous Australian national consciousness, I would say. Did, did people call Australia Australia before 1901? The name Australia for the continent was proposed in 1817 by Governor Macquarie. Hmm. Um, and... Um, to replace the term New Holland, and it quickly gained favour, um, I have to say, though very confusingly, because New South Wales, right, remained one component colony, if you like, of the continent, and in New South Wales, Australia was often used. So, for example, the Australian Museum is the Museum of New South Wales, but it's called the Australian Museum. Sydney siders will know it in, in College Street. Right. Um, in fact, Henry Parks blithely proposed in 1888 that New South Wales rename itself Australia, which actually <laughs> wasn't well received by the other colonies. It's a bit like Yorkshire deciding to call itself England, isn't it? Um, <laughs> but if I were sitting, I mean, I mean, if I were sitting in the whatever it was called, the you know the the Empire Office back in London in 1890, let's say. And, and yeah. someone referred to Australia. Would it have meant the continent we now think of as Australia? Would have it included new, what we now call New Zealand? Oh, absolutely. I mean, what, what, would it have, what, would it, what would it have meant? Until 1901, Australia commonly meant what we would call Australia, but minus Tasmania. It was a okay. geographical expression to include the five mainland states. Right. Australasia would have included the five mainland states, Tasmania and New Zealand, as it, that phrase is sometimes, that expression word is sometimes used today for essentially the same purpose. But I guess the important thing is there to distinguish between New Zealand and the six states of Australia, as we now do so commonly, it would have been, would have been quite foreign to them. It would mm. have been complete. It's completely anachronistic to distinguish um, New Zealand in the 19th century from the colonies on the other side of the Tasman Sea. You know, we, we lots of people fall prey to that. I had an, an argument, well, an argument, a discussion with one of my graduate students a good 10 years ago. He was from Austria. And when I mentioned that, you know, except for an accident of history, Austria would have been German. He, of course, thought I meant because of World War II and, and you know, the, the Hitler. And, and I said, no, don't you read your own history? I mean, in 1848, Austrian patriots <laughs> were singing Deutsch Liberalis, meaning we are all German. We're not Austrian and Bavarian and uh, you know, Hanoverian. And then again, in 1918, the Austrian government petitioned the uh, victors at Versailles could they join Germany and were refused? <laughs> you know, so for accident of history, now you tell an Austrian that today and, you know, they get upset. Of course, Austria is a separate country, always have been. And I wonder if New Zealanders don't maybe have that same chip on their shoulder that, you know, how dare you suggest that New Zealand, you know, that, that people in Wellington and Auckland today might be patriotic Australians, but for the accident of 1901? Um, look, it's a very interesting question. Obviously, Austrian identity was formed, as it is today, was formed by the traumatic events of 1938 to 1945. Right. And before yeah. then, there was no Austrian identity. And you're quite right. I believe the Austrian Republic was formerly known, of, of the pre interwar period, was formerly known as German Austria. Okay? Mm. Yeah, there was... There was um, there was uh, no sense of Austrian identity, but the war, the Second World War, changed all that. With New Zealand, um, I think it's a bit different. I think the counterfactual, which we probably should entertain, is not so much a New Zealand in the Commonwealth, but a Western Australia, distinct from the rest of 
the other five states of the Commonwealth and existing itself like New Zealand. I, I think I thought, that is... William, yeah. I'm a little confused. I thought Western Australia seceded in 2000 when coronavirus hit. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, it's, it's been a separate it's, country well, for two years now, hasn't it? <laughs> well, that's right. Well, that, that, and I think that reflects um, my point is that Western Australia's decision to join um, the Federation in 1900, very late, um, just as the door was about to close, was really an importunate decision, a hasty one, and quickly regretted um, by even the most forcible advocates of Federation. It's really Western Australia's decision to join the Commonwealth, which is the historical accident, I think, and which was probably very unfortunate for Western Australia because it meant that it was being cast in a minor role in a drama scripted um, by others. New Zealand, very fortunately, though it, if you like, explored the idea of joining the Federation, quickly cooled and for its own good fortune was, was never part of it. I mean, do, you, do you think there would be room for five or six countries in this continent? I mean, is there... Uh, no, you know, no, maybe sacrilegious, but I don't think I, I think Western Australia could have done a New Zealand, as I've said. But um, I think the other five, oh, sure, there's a, a rational reasons for a closer political integration, particularly in light of the military military events of, this, of the 20th century. Um, but what Australia really needs is a confederal structure, not a federal structure. It's like Canada, in other words, which is nominally um, a federation, which is really a confederation. Well, they even they even call the creation of Canada the confederation of Canada, not yeah, yeah, the yeah. federation. So the process in Canada is known as a process yeah. of confederation, yeah, which was about right. 1860 yeah. something. And despite their nominally centralist constitution, it does in fact operate confederally and there's always a despite the huge if you like almost ideological pressure for centralization confederalism in australia keeps on breaking out i mean we have this council of australian governments is it national cabinet whatever it is it just seems to be a natural way for australia to operate confederally rather than um <coughs> rather than american style more federally which is um, probably possibly suited to the America's vast population and the fact that it has 50 states. It's a bit hard to think of a confeder confederally operating with 50 states, but I think it would suit Australia. Hmm. Anthony's telling us that uh, Phillips Commission defined New South Wales to uh, run from the east coast and westward, quote, as far as the 135th degree of longitude. Um, I don't know where the 135th uh, degree of longitude is. Do, do you, by, by any chance, are well, you familiar think, with this? Well, well, it's approximately the western, the, the the border of Western Australia with South Australia and the Northern Territory today. Uh, or was it a okay. to that? But it, it was approximately that. So essentially, what is it, Philip was saying, or sorry, Andrew was saying, is that um, Western Australia was not part of the original colony of New South Wales. Indeed, it's the only part of Australia which was not part of. New South Wales. That that's sort of underlines my point that Western Australia truly has a different constitutional genesis than than um, the rest of Australia. So, so were the uh, were all of the eastern states of Australia? Uh, do they ultimately all derive from New South Wales in the yes, same yes. way that the whole United States ultimately derives from Virginia? I mean, the the Pilgrims were supposed to land in the Virginia colony. <laughs> they just missed it. Oh, that's right. Fire. I didn't appreciate that. They oh, their, sort of their, their charter was from the Virginia company. <laughs> it was to come and they, were supposed, sure to, they were supposed to end yeah. up somewhere around what's uh, the Chesapeake Peninsula and, uh, you know, know, to end up in what's now Maryland, I suppose. And they, you know, right. they weren't that accurate back then. They thought, we're I here now, know. we better settle. Yeah, yeah. Now, all of Australia, say Western Australia, was the colony of New South Wales and Tasmania separated in 1825. Victoria in 1851, Queensland in 1859, South Australia in 1836. And um, yeah, New Zealand was, it's always unclear whether New Zealand was part of the colony of New South Wales, but by 1840 something it was doing, it was on its own. Yeah. 
So New South Wales was sort of the mother colony, which seems like an absurd expression, but it was used in the 19th century. And to the 19th century, it was important to New South Wales that it was sort of the start of everything. Yeah. And yet, a bit for, like a long, Virginia. And yet for a long time, Toria was larger. Is that correct? In population, it I was, mean. It was larger in population for a period of about 40 years, a key period from about 18... About 1860 to about 18, up to about 1900. Yeah. Wow. Could you imagine if I'm the capital? That would have been a disaster. Oh, well, it, 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 it is, it is, um, it was a plain intention of, of Alfred Deacon to make Melbourne the London of a kind of um, united Commonwealth of Great Australia. Absolutely, without any doubt. And the Constitution required the capital be within New South Wales. Deacon's response, therefore, successful response, was just before he became Prime Minister, was to pass an act making the capital in within New South Wales on the very border with Victoria in a desolate mountainous spot called Dalgetty, right? And it was very obviously done in false, in, in bad faith. It was very obviously done to make sure that nobody would ever want to move from Melbourne to Dalgetty, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're talking to William Coleman about his uh, new book, Their Fiery Cross of Union, and uh, it is available now from Connor Court. But we'd also like to talk about the, the university systems that both of us work in. Um, I can't help noticing, again, as a foreigner, that you know, people who appear in your book, uh, like Deakin, like Griffith, uh, ended up with universities named after them. Uh, how large, I mean, I, I, I mean, as a foreigner, I was un, unaware that these universities were named for Federation figures. And, and for most Australians, obviously for, you know, historic historians like you, or, you know, I mean, a custom historian, but for academics like you, you, you know the story. But for most Australians, how familiar are the names of those, you know, the Parkses, the Griffiths, the Deacons? Are those meaningful oh, names for them? I think Parks is nominally well known, partly because for many years, and perhaps still is, I forget, I'm afraid, he was on, was he on the $5 note? As I say, perhaps he, perhaps he still is. I think the consciousness of the others is much, much less. Um, Victorians are probably a bit conscious of Deakin. There is, of course, Deakin um, University. But it's it's also just as... Um, um, uh, Australians don't find federation very interesting, right? I believe school teachers find that children are bored by it, right? It's not a drum and trumpet thing. It's not a blood and guts thing. It's sort of rather prosy sort of thing. And, um, yeah, I, I would say the consciousness of the founding fathers as they became to be styled in the 1950s amongst Australians is um, typically quite low. Right, but, I mean, in America there's this, veneration for the constitution to such a degree that um it well in the book i'm currently working on on liberal authoritarianism in practice which you can also find me uh blogging about on my channel uh it, oh. it you know I'm, I'm characterizing the u.s constitution as having a charismatic quality in, in max weber's sense yeah. of charismatic yeah. legitimacy yeah. All its own. That, yes. that even not being a human being, it has a charismatic quality, like uh, uh, you know Magna Carta in the same way. You don't have to read yes. it to think of it yes. as some kind of iconic moment in your history. Um, yes. Does Federation play that same role for Australians, or no. is it just kind of a legal process? Well, not not the Constitution. There's no charismatic um, charismatic uh, sparkle or aura about the constitution despite efforts of the commonwealth government to try to, to 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 create one so you can go down to the national archives and i think they reverently preserve there the very pen and and, and ink pot which queen victoria used to um, sign the constitution of the commonwealth of australia act and indeed i think there might be um is it possible that the very act on parchment is there down at the National Archives. But no, it's never caught the imagination of, um, uh, of, of the Australian population, um, partly because it's a not very original uh, cut and paste job of um, the American Constitution, the Canadian Constitution, and various acts governing the governance of, 
of, Vic, of New South Wales and Victoria, uh, partly because it's just not as well written. The American Constitution begins <laughs> with, we the people. Yeah, well, that's all. Form our perfect union, That's establish right. justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the yeah. general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty. Well, that's do, uh, for ourselves and our posterity to ordain and establish this constitution yeah. for the United States of America. I can even quote it. Right. Well, that's wonderful. I mean, the Australian Constitution begins, yeah. whereas the people, which sort of sounds a bit legalistic, doesn't it? Whereas yeah. the people. <laughs> So no. It, well, it, it, better than the. Yes. It, it, it's better than the European Union, where the Treaty of Rome is. Right. Um, whereas right. the Queen of England, the President of Italy, the right. <laughs> you know the uh, yeah. no, well, not Queen of England, she wasn't there. But whereas the President of Italy, the uh, right. you know the President of France, the Majest you know so and so of of Belgium, and uh, you know it was these leaders got together and created right. the European. Right community so um, so at least I'll right. show a little closer to the people well that's similar to the, the australian constitution which says whereas i think i'm i'm not sure whether it's the people or just was it, it, it then it iterates five states new south wales right. through to Tasmania, leaves out yeah. western australia because western australia still hadn't decided to join it right but oh. yeah it's, it's a similar sort of procedural approach to to what's right. going so, yeah, it's, look, Australia is a legalistic country. America is a legalistic country yeah. too, but um, in a different sort of sort of way. So Australia has certainly taken the Constitution very seriously. Right? I mean, there are sections of the Constitution which have literally generated millions of words. Section 92, for example, quite literally millions of words. So it's important in a legalistic sense, but only in that sense. Yeah. Well, um Anthony, uh, you and the Samuel Griffith Society have your work cut out for you, it seems, in uh, popularizing the Australian Constitution. Now, the university system was already there in its, you know, formative stages at Federation. Um, university of Sydney was, uh, and University of Melbourne were both founded in the, what, 1860s, I think it was, no, 1864. Uh, 1850. For the University of Sydney, a little bit later. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know Melbourne was one year later, much to their, um, yeah. uh, you know, for their perpetual uh, chagrin. Um, mm. Did the university academics and did the universities play any role in the oh, federation yes. process? Look, one of the curious things about federation is the prominence, the great prominence of university educated people. You must remember how tiny were the universities at this time. So to illustrate, when Edmund Barton, the first Prime Minister of the Commonwealth, attended lectures at the University of Sydney in the mid 1860s, there were about a total of 10 undergraduates. That's the total, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's not the Latin class, that's everybody, right? Of all and our years. procedures, I, I'll point out, our procedures are still based on the idea that we have 10 students. It's oh, a nightmare. Exactly. Well, I'm sure they are. Yeah, yeah. So. Despite the extremely tiny enrolments, um, if you look at, say, the New South Wales delegates to the Federation Convention, I think you'll find four university graduates. Similarly, the Victoria's delegation, you, you had a strong representation of uh, university people, including Isaac Isaacs, um, uh, John, um, John Quick. He was actually a, a doctor. Can you believe it? Um, I mean, in the, in the academic sense, um, right. Alfred Deakin attended Melbourne University. So there's a remarkable preponderance of university graduates um, amongst the convention delegates, totally out of proportion. Totally and you mean Australian university graduates, not not Oxford, Cambridge, Edinburgh. That, that's true. You're quite right, too. And that's worth noting. They were Australian university graduates because Federation was very much an elite project in its in its conception it wasn't a grassroots project in any way but the universities were certainly very interested in it so um as i you know so the leader of the no campaign in new south wales in the 1899 referendum was the chancellor of the um of the of sydney university and oh. george weed's close advisor in the yes campaign of 1899 was a future chancellor of the sydney university a man called william cullen so yes, the universities were very much 
part of it, reflecting the elite nature of the whole project. Well, speaking of universities, I do have a moment to plug my own book, Australia's Universities, Can They Reform? Spoiler alert, the answer is no. (laughs) Please do check out the book, available now from Ocean Reeve Publishing. And the book was the prompt for the professor's podcast. I really just wanted to talk to colleagues about the state of universities. And although their fiery cross of union wasn't about universities, it was as good an excuse to any to get to talk To you, Um, what is your own thought about how Australia's universities are doing today? Uh, Are they, you know, are they still the leading conscience of the nation as they they were 120 years ago? Or uh, uh, I'm not sure if they're the leading conscience of the nation 120 years ago. I'm not sure when (laughs) Australian universities peaked. They probably peaked in the uh, sort of well, very broadly, very broadly in the post-war period, 70s, 80s, they probably peaked then. And now they're in steep decline as universities are across the world. They have become more than ever just um, haunts of bigotry, um, um, seminaries of various secular um, religions, um, uh, beholden to bureaucracy, and to money in a very corrupt manner. So, yeah, they're in a bad way, as universities are everywhere. Well, beholden to to money is an, is an interesting accusation, since, of course, I, for, in the research for the book, Australia's Universities, Can They Reform? I, I did a lot of uh, digging into government funding for universities in Australia, which really, you know, the calls... So, so Australian universities... Um, early on started to call, when I say early on, I mean the 1920s, started to call for the federalization of universities. So to, to take mm-hmm. university funding out of the stingy state politics yeah. where they had been for yeah. decades and to find yeah. a new sponsor in the yeah. uh, Commonwealth government in Canberra. Yeah. And for the last hundred years, of course, you know, the Commonwealth has been the primary funder of universities. So I, I do wonder, you know, has there been, well, you know, what is that connection between the universities and the Commonwealth? How did it come about? I don't know if this is something you have a lot of. Uh, well, it's, it's, a very good, it's a very good question. Universities suffered in the interwar period from, it was obviously a, a, a economically. Well, everyone suffered, right? So, yeah. 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 But they suffered from the sense that they were <clears throat> simply just finishing schools for the elite, right? So Labor governments generally wouldn't touch them, with the great exception of the Fogg and Smith Labor government of Queensland, which built very deliberately and at considerable expense the beautiful campus at St Lucia in Brisbane. So there were exceptions, but generally... Um, because they were just considered as, as I say, finishing schools, Labor governments didn't want to know about it. Now, World War II came along and suddenly universities, uh, the idea of the Australian National University did appear as a great research university, no undergraduates, but it would be researching for the nation. Remember the whole, the whole as I said earlier, actually, the whole sense of an Australian nation was very much <clears throat> um, very much charged during the Second World War, and the idea of research as something terribly useful also became very much um, charged. So that was the Commonwealth's first important entree into the university uh, sector. And then in the post-war period, the Commonwealth was relatively flush with funds, and very usefully began to fund universities. So things like tutorials, right, which were not offered um, before the 1960s, typically in Australian universities, could be funded thanks to this Commonwealth largesse. But there was a terrible price. Uh, The price was control, right? We now have um, this monstrously centralised education system. I mean, it's been said Australia has... Only one university with thirty-six campuses, and there's a lot. Of <laughs> well, yeah. well, so that's 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 the question I have: is to to what degree is there really control? I mean, World War II, 
the Commonwealth said, we want doctors and engineers. And the universities pretty much responded with, well, we'll give you archaeologists and, <laughs> and philosophers. And they were very resistant. I mean, they did ultimately cooperate with the Commonwealth in trying to, to graduate more doctors. But, um, but they resisted as opposed to embracing the war needs of the country. It was, well, if we can get more money by grudgingly embracing the war needs, we'll do it. But it's not really what we're interested in. And to me, that's been the narrative for the last 80 years. It's certainly a narrative today, as I see it, that instead of bending over backwards to serve the priorities that are set by well, let's face it, you know, the elected government, uh, you know, elected by the Australian people. My impression is that universities are much more interested in getting that money from the government so that they can, you know, nominally check the box they did what the government required, but really just do what they wanted to do in the first place. Is that not your, your experience? It, it probably is. I mean, I, I guess I, what I would say, though, is a kind of prefatory comment to this this particular exchange is that um, I think there's something melancholy and deficient in universities being funded from general revenue, from mm. the taxpayer. Um, I think universities um, should be based on a genuine loan system or just by paying fees up front, um, but a loan system in which the student deals directly with the, with the sorry, the university deals directly with the student Right, like the U.S. Not this kind of system. Yeah, not the yeah. centralized, naturalized, nationalized loan system coming through Canberra, which is just another form of regulation. But a genuine loan system, combined with those who are wealthy enough, can pay fees. I'd much rather see universities funded that way. But yes, to the extent that there's a room for taxpayer um, funding, sure, the taxpayer should have its voice, and sure, the universities, doubtless in their own way do their best to pay lip service, and then right. ignore it, for sure. I, I'm saying I find very amusing is there's the recurring scandal of the ARC, the Australian Research Council, funding yeah. you know, hugely uh, uh, controversial humanities yeah. research, yeah. and then almost daring <laughs> the... the, the you know, usually the liberal minister to to veto it, and of course, when the minister vetoes it, you know, it becomes a scandal. But a large portion, I, I think it's ten or fifteen percent of the um, evaluation for an ARC grant is national interest grounds. But what's funny is, I mean, if Mr. simply used that national interest grounds and gave it a score, well, you know. Any grant application that got a zero for national interest, well, you know, the 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 the, the thin line between acceptance and rejection, the line between acceptance and rejection for ARC grants is so thin that if you lose all the points on national interest, you'll never get the ARC yeah. grant. But yeah, yeah. the government allows national interest to be evaluated by the academics as well. <laughs> right. So when I act as an ARC assessor, I am yeah, yeah, to assess yeah. is this grant in the national interest, which seems yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can assess its academic qualifications, but uh, shouldn't, you know, like, I, I, it's strange to hear an academic say it, maybe, but I'd like to actually see more government oversight of universities, not less. Well, 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 well I would, I think that certainly outside of um, health research, um, I would like to see all research funding just done by the universities from their own resources. Kaboom, right? If you want to fund research, you go and fund it. Now, where does that leave genuine national purpose uh, research? Well, I think that should be done by a Commonwealth body almost directly, as you say, right? It's too Cyro. Um, yeah, a bit like that. Or, or it doesn't have to be an institution, but it, it will be direct semi-directly done by the government rather than, if you like, contracting it out to academics, nine out of ten of which, um, you know, uh, would despise um, any coalition government. Yeah. Well, I I'm not even sure that they only despise coalition governments. <laughs> we'll see oh, yeah. what they think of a Labour government when yeah. they get one. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's yeah, it's sure. a um, yeah. I'm not I'm not sure about that. Uh, the <laughs> the uh, my my own research into university finance, of course, is focused on a lot on the role of international students and on you know universities using international student fees as a way to achieve autonomy from the government. And in you know in your preferred model, I, I'm afraid that we would see instead of seeing less abuse, we would see even more abuse that you know universities freed to just fund their research how they want would simply turn to you know turn their universities effectively into visa mills uh, to generate uh, already. Well, they are already. There's no doubt about that. But I think they are because of the lack of government oversight, not because of too much government oversight. Well, um, I don't see any great interest on government oversighting um, the fact that Australian universities so often are degree mills. Um, they're quite glad for universities to be degree mills um, because it means less screaming at the government for, for, for funding, right? Because they're, because they're degree mills. Um, look, um, this brings us to um, very, the fundamental problems um, of universities. They are selling their reputations. Their reputations were built over 150 years and they are selling them. Um, and it's not as if it's wrong to sell a reputation, but you have to sell it at the right price. They're underpricing it massively and thereby destroying their reputation. Um, but how you, uh, I don't see a bureaucrat as solving that problem. Um, it's it's a, just a dilemma of our time, I would say. I, what I would like to see actually in Australia is, is more political leadership. And again, it may seem strange to hear an, an academic say it, but uh, you know, my main criticism of Australian universities is the lack of community engagement. And, and I'm going to use community oh, broadly to, to include yeah. government, but also industry, parents, groups, yeah. alumni, that, you know, we should be subject to a lot more, well, you know, peering into our accounts and a lot more looking at what we do in the classroom. Uh, yeah, we should be held responsible to the societies well, look, that part of the problem. Part of the problem is that every university in Australia, with one possible exception, is a state, that is to say, a government university, right? The United States is private universities, but that's not to say that all is well at Harvard, right? You know, right. I mean, just being private isn't, isn't, doesn't make for a good university. Alas, Australian universities are also a very big. Okay, now the United States, obviously, it is. 15 times the population, but there's 3,000 degree granting university institutions, right? We have 36 or 37, right? So our universities are also just, just far too large. Um, but, but I agree um, our universities are really um, disconnected from their communities, disconnected from parents, really, um, and even uh, campuses these days, I think, are fairly dead places, particularly outside the GA, <coughs> but even in the GA. I, 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 I surprised reporters when I told them that uh, Australia's universities, and particularly group of eight universities, would be among the largest universities in, in yeah. all of North America if they were Absolutely. in the US. Because the narrative has Absolutely. been, oh, we need university mergers to create economies oh, of no. scale, larger universities. Oh, no. Quite the opposite. Yeah. Oh, how many mergers? in Australia, which have ended in, 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 in misery. But it, nowadays, we recently had the suggestion that, that three or is it four Western Australian universities should combine. And in South Australia, I mean, it's just all too much nonsense. It is the aggrandizement of university bureaucrats who just drive these things to the complete destruction of university experience, for sure. Well, Adelaide and, and South Australia are roughly... Yeah at the average size for the University of California system. And in my book, I several times used the University of California yeah. system as a proxy because, you know, California is of similar population to Australia. Yeah, and, well, 40 million you know, people, just like South Australia. You know, you know, so, 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 and, uh, but 
you know, Australian universities are enormous by University of California standards. And you can't complain that University of California system, you know, you can complain a lot about it, but you can't complain that they are uh, unprestigious, underperforming universities. You know, they're, they're very prestigious universities. Um, yet there's this strange notion that Australian universities are too small and underfunded. And uh, all the data show me that they're very large and very generously yeah. funded. Yeah. 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 Uh, so do you think that there is, is any appetite to not, I won't say appetite. I know the answer to that question. Would there be any benefit to relocalizing universities? That is seeing the states more involved instead of seeing the universities as, I mean, I know that they're legal creatures of the states, but they are in, in practice yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. creatures of the Commonwealth. Would, would there be any benefit in returning universities well, to their it, states? It, well, it could be hardly be worse, could it? It could hardly be worse. It would have the benefits of the federal system, which a genuine federal system, which is competition of governments. That's the key thing, to have competition between governments. And we get a bit of competition between governments. We be, get a bit of, um, instead of having one size fits all, instead of having this appalling unified um, system of um, 36 campuses and just one university, um, it would allow a few more flowers to bloom. But having said that, um, I, I see that the universities, problems of universities are much deeper than the institutional structure. It's partly our age, right? The, what, our your, your age, age, age? Lost. <laughs> Are we getting too old? <laughs> no, I, our epic. It's I our know, epic, I right? know. Yeah. Um, our epic is, is, is not one of ideas, right? It's the epic of the algorithm, isn't it, right? And um, the world is not interested in ideas. It's not even interested in in knowledge of, it, of any significance, I would, ha I would have to say. I say this as somebody who deals with students. Um, the deal, I'm, I'm say, I would say this, are, this is reflected in the average, average outlook of students, the average outlook of students I want to reflect. So yeah, I think that's one of the deep underlying problems of um, universities. There has to be a, a return to an interest um, in ideas. I mean, I, there's quite a few Australian universities you can walk around and you'll see a little poster which says, believe. That's a shocking <laughs> thing, right? It should be think, argue, reason, but believe. You know, that's part of the loss of the life of the mind, which is very characteristic of our epic. I, I laugh every time I see my university advertised on the side of a bus going down Oxford Street, and I think... You know, that's what we've come to. <laughs> We're an ad on the side of a bus. Um, look, yeah, yeah. Uh, Christopher Carr wants to ask, is the central purpose of a university research or teaching? And then follows up with, has credentialism undermined the traditional role of the university? Where do you stand on the research teaching divide? Look, um, I think the teaching comes for research. I have to say that without diminishing research, a research only institute is not a university. It's quite a different creature. It might be valuable, it might be useful. It is not a university. Put it another way, a university can just teach, right? As I believe there are perfectly respectable liberal arts colleges in the United States, which don't do doctorates, right? They teach. But a university can't just research. Um, for one thing, research only institute, for one thing, there's a complementarity between teaching and research. And I think that's been brought out by reviews of the famous Princeton Institute of Advanced Studies. You know, that was created in the 1940s simply to park great minds and to remove them from any distraction from the classroom where they would be very fertile. And generally it's been, I think, not a bit of summary statement, not a great success. It's um, a place has scholars the go to die, but they, uh, but they add their right. aura of prestige to Princeton. That's right. That's right. So teaching is complementary to research. And I believe it is the fundamental essence of the university. Yeah. But to give my own answer, and of course, I encourage you to find my answer in Australian universities, can they reform? But to give my own answer, yeah. um, look, the whole reason we have research in universities is the argument that people who are teaching 
should be engaged in research. That is, it, it, teaching at universities, research is what distinguishes teaching at universities from teaching in high schools. You know, high school teachers teach received knowledge. There's a textbook, you've been told what the answers are. You can go to the back of the book, and there are the answers to the study questions in the teacher's edition. Um, well, the, you know, the, the job of schools is to teach students settled knowledge. Uh, the job of universities, well, for at least in the whole model of the research university, but even before that, when you, before the research university, when, re, when university teachers were scholars, but not necessarily researchers, again, the point was that universities were places where you had, well, teachers who were at the frontier. But the reason we have research in universities is that the teachers wanted the opportunity to do research. It, it wasn't because universities themselves were founded as research institutions. And because we divide well, our workload, you know, 40, 40, 20 teaching research yeah. service, the notion has arisen that, well, well we could we could employ 40 people to do teaching, 40 people to do research, and 20 people to do service. It's all fixed. Yeah, yeah I think... Uh, look, um... I think there are two observations I'd like to make. Firstly, there's always been the view that research, alas, is a racket, okay? It's a way of academics to escape teaching. And I'm afraid there's a lot of truth in that. Now, I'm not saying, therefore, that research isn't worthwhile, but it, we should be a bit wary of um, all proposals to dedicate research-only positions and so on, right? I mean, teaching is work, all right? Uh, in a way, I would say research is not, is not. Right? No, it's play. Research can just be a reparation. Teaching is work. I think that's the yeah, first thing I'd say. The other thing I'd say is I turn to the beginning of your comments. I quite agree it's important that universities be full of scholars, not schoolmasters, if I could put it that way. There's a very important difference. Um, in that, in the, in in those two different experiences, and <clears throat> yes, I, I I grant a research test is probably a way of keeping out schoolmasters from universities. That's right. Good. Research. William Coleman's their fiery cross of union, a retelling uh, of the creation of the Australian Federation, is available at Connor Court, forty four dollars. I encourage you to get a copy. I've got mine. And uh, William, thanks for joining me today on the Professor's Podcast. Thanks so much, Salvatore. It's been a great experience. <laughs> all right. Thanks to all of you for watching. And I'll be back next week. I hope you'll see us then. Bye-bye.